we are in so doing rejecting eternal life. Just as there is life in every word of God, every word, rejecting one word that comes from Him rejects all of God's words. The Sabbath rest is God's rest. God's rest is perfection. And perfection can only be obtained by perfect faith. There's only one faith, and that is the faith of Jesus to which each one of us has been given a measure. Amen. Romans 12, verse 3. So the seventh day rest commemorates a very good and complete creation in the beginning and also a blessed reminder of the biblical fact that on the cross, Christ, the same creative power by which Christ created everything in the beginning is that same creative power that delivers the believer from the power and slavery of the sin condition. Amen. This profound thought is found in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And I will read verses 10 and 11. Romans chapter 6. The heading in my Bible for Romans chapter 6 is Believers are dead to sin condition, alive to God. Romans 6, beginning with verse 10. For the death that Christ died, He died to the sin condition, once for everybody. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to the sin condition, but alive to God, where? In Christ Jesus. The power of the cross, therefore, is creative power. When on the cross Jesus said, it is finished, he was simply announcing that in him, through his cross, you and I can now experience the perfect works of God and creation and also a completed redemption. That biblical fact makes the believer in Christ complete in everything. And now, God can pronounce you also very good. The Sabbath rest also means victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the worlds were made. The Sabbath rest is a remnant of Eden. A one-seventh percent. Do you like that? Yeah. Before sin entered, the relationship between God and the human race was intended to last for eternity. Yeah. As one very perceptive thinker has recorded, in a very, 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 very popular book. Let me quote it to you. Desire of Ages, page 331, beginning with the first sentence, second sentence, and third sentence of the very last paragraph of a chapter with a very <coughs> interesting title, chapter 34, The Invitation. The Invitation from whom? From Christ. Quote, as through Jesus we enter into R-E-S-T, heaven begins here. Amen. Amen. Second sentence. We respond to his invitation, come learn of me, and in thus coming, we begin the life eternal. Amen. Where does heaven begin? Right here. Right here. Where does life eternal begin? Here. Right here. But the only ones that can experience it are those that understand the four-letter word that we're studying today. Resting in Christ. Third sentence. Heaven is a ceaseless approaching to God through Christ. Amen. 
Sin, however, is total rebellion against God and our refusal to be dependent and our demand to be self-dependent. That is not a pretty picture. So let me read it to you from Scripture. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. For even though they knew God, who is the they? Those that God brought out of Egypt. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. 23. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man or birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's the result when a human being does not understand and chooses not to rest in Christ. So when Adam and Eve separated the human race from God and lost the meaning, the blessing of the Sabbath rest, the Sabbath rest lost its significance. Isaiah 59 verse 2. By resting in the tomb though, during the seventh day, Christ restores the significance of a very good and complete creation and a perfect and complete redemption. Resting in the tomb during the seventh day, Sabbath, Christ established and confirmed the solution to two major issues that still exist today. In his message to the seven churches recorded in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus uses one word seven times and he applies that word to all seven churches. That word is overcome. Then in John 16, the very last word, verse of chapter 16, Jesus makes an incredible statement for each one of us. John 16, the very last verse of the chapter. John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me, Jesus is speaking, you may have suke, peace, so that you may never forget that I have what? Set you at one again. In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have what? Overcome the world. Amen. Then in 1 John 2 16, Jesus inspires John, also known as John the Revelator, to describe in great detail what are the issues that Jesus overcame that we just got through reading in John 16 33. I'm reading 1 John 2, 16. Here are the issues that Jesus overcame. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride in life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Do you like that? I have news for you. It gets better. Then Jesus applies the issue of overcoming to each one of us, Revelation 3, Revelation 3, 21, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. It doesn't get any better than that. If you have something more exciting, to look forward to on planet Earth, please tell me about it. <laughs> Another 
word that is used in a similar way to the word R-E-S-T is the word abide. Jesus frequently used the word abide in speaking to his disciples. When the disciples, the twelve disciples, completed their training to take over Jesus' work when he left the heaven, Jesus did what everyone does that graduates from a course. He delivered a commencement address. Mm -hmm. That commencement address is recorded in John chapter 13 all the way to chapter 17. Right smack in the middle of that commencement address, Jesus says something incredible to his graduating class. It begins with verse 4 of John 15. Here's the word. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. This is incredible. Look what Jesus associates himself with when he was on this earth. I am the vine. What happens to a vine if it doesn't attach itself to something and start growing up? It gets stumped to death. So Jesus is saying, I am the vine. You are the branches. And he who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the application of the word abide to his graduating class. Then, Jesus inspires John to apply the word abide to you and to me. That appears in 1 John chapter 3. You're getting familiar with the books of the Bible this morning. We've been going back and forth. It's a good exercise. 1 John chapter 3. Verses 6 through 9. This is the application of the word abide to you and to me. Beginning with verse 6. No one who abides in me sins. The word sins there is a verb. No one who abides in me can sin. No one who sins has seen me or known him. What an incredible arbitrary statement. Jesus is saying... Once you enter into a relationship with me, resting in me, I'm not going to let you go. As long as you choose to rest in me. Seven, little children, we're not talking about age group, we're talking about people that are new believers. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as God is righteous. Look at eight. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. Nine. No one who is born of God, practices sin. Because God's seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born because he is born of God. If you believe that Jesus is a reliable source and that the scriptures are the inspired word of God, you now have indisputable evidence that God's version of Christian living, including commandment keeping, <coughs> is possible. And it will become a reality in your life once you choose to rest, or if you prefer, abide in the author of creation, the author and finisher of redemption, and of faith. 1 John 5 through 5 and Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. The second issue about the seventh day rest is really not a biblical issue. 
And the issue is, what day should you and I go to church to worship God? Two quotations. One from the head of the Protestant organization. There's a Protestant organization. This is the statement. Protestant scholars admit that there is no biblical authority for the change of the seventh day to Sunday. None. End quote. Another well-known organization, the Catholic Church, makes a similar statement. Quote, we acknowledge that the change of the Sabbath was made by our church and declare that Protestants, by observing Sunday, are recognizing our and accepting our power and authority to do so, end quote. Those historical statements are recorded in a very popular book called Great Controversy. The title of the chapter is God's Law Immutable, pages 447 through 450. Again, if you believe that Jesus is a reliable source, and that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, Jesus Himself answers the question, what day should we go to church and worship God? Matthew 5. Last scripture. Matthew 5. Three verses. Beginning with verse 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Finally, 19. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Resting on the seventh day Sabbath acknowledges, again, a very good and complete creation, a perfect and complete redemption. And with your permission, Jesus guarantees that He will restore His character in you. Amen. Entering God's rest is the most relevant and time-sensitive biblical topic today. Because the rest and the restoration are inseparable. Amen. There is no other issue. You and I have the responsibility to witness this seventh-day rest to a perishing world. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 383.
loving Father, we thank you for answering our request to indwell us with your Holy Spirit so that we can understand that you have celebrated everything that you have ever done by resting on a specific day, signifying that everything that you have done at creation, at the cross, and in our individual lives, if we will allow you, is guaranteed. Amen. Help us to recognize that you are the one that delivers on this guarantee and that all you're looking from us is willingness. I pray that that will be the conviction of each of our hearts because I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.